Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the first allocator call taking place on May 28th. Let's take a look at what we have on the schedule for today. We're going to start off with just a quick review. When do these meetings take place and where can you find the recordings? So if we reference something that happened in a past meeting, we'll just make sure that you're tracking where to find that information. We'll quickly review just what's happened in the last two weeks since our last call. We'll go over some of the metrics that have come through, what we've seen as far as distributions. The bulk of this call will focus on two points. Point number one is what does a data cap refresh look like for an allocator organization? So essentially, what goes into that audit of data cap distributions? We'll talk about what the governance team is looking at. We'll talk about what requirements are there for the allocators, as well as what community members are encouraged to look at and sign. Next, there's a lot of updates that have been happening with making the rolling applications a real thing. So this will allow allocators to apply or organizations to apply to become an allocator without having to wait for that yearly election cycle. So we're pleased to announce some updates with that. We have a live recording of what that process looks like and then answer any questions. On the call, we also have time allocated to talk about two issues that have come over on Slack. These are tooling. Just wanted to check in and make sure that you all have answers for that. And we have lots of time allocated. So if you're an allocator and you have questions about, hey, how do I ensure that I stay in compliance? What's being looked at? We'll be happy to look at your application or discuss or go over whatever may be. So as always, feel free to raise a hand in chat or just wait to the call. The call is yours as we go forward. So with that, let's take a look. Today is May 28th. Next call will take place on June 11th. The calls are pinned to the UTC time code because that way it won't change. So some of us may see this call shift in our local time zone, depending on daylight savings time. But if you just pin to the UTC in 02, it should update automatically. And if you want, there's a shared Google calendar, which is in the links. If you follow this calendar, it'll auto update for your individual time zone. I realize that this can be tricky. So I apologize for that. And thanks for your patience. Just follow this link and it should get you all set. As far as meetings go, we record all of these calls. They're typically posted to YouTube same day or next day. You can find them in the public channel called Allocator Governance, and they'll be chronological as they go through. We also share these meeting invites in Slack. So if you see that post come through, I'll leave a comment in every Slack issue with the slides, which some of you are in already, as well as where to find this recording. If there's any topics that you'd like to ensure get put onto this meeting, you can always DM us or post in the Slack, or I'll make an item in GitHub in the allocator governance issue. I do this after every call. So if you want to see a specific topic or have a specific question you want to make sure gets covered, if you put that in this issue, I'll add it onto the agenda. I also link the meeting recordings and slides to all of those. So whether you have Slack or GitHub, that should be a great resource to find it as well as these meetings being on YouTube. Let's take a look at metrics. So not a lot of changes from May 14th to May 28th. The slide that you see on the left there for May 14th, that was obviously from the last governance call. And just wanted to highlight some things we've seen. We've seen six new allocators come on board in this two week span and 16 new data application clients served in that time with a total of 27 petabytes distributed. So we're seeing a lot of really sustainable growth Looking forward to seeing that carry forward. And if you have any questions, please let us know. So with that, let's get into the one of the main topics on the call, which is what is diligence required look like for this data cap refresh? So maybe the best way to kind of highlight this is I'll kind of kick it off. And then we are also nice, we have Galen on the call, so he can provide a little bit more of like any tactical or high level points. And again, if you have questions, feel free to shoot a hand up or ask away in chat and get you supported. So let's start with the process at a very high level. So essentially for the data cap to be distributed, we gave every allocator a five petabyte allocation, which was very different than the LDN model where everyone just kind of shared it. And the goal of this five petabytes was twofold. First was to get a sense of how fast this data cap is going out for each allocator. But second and more importantly, is give each allocator enough data cap that they can start making these distribution deals while fine tuning and resolving their individual process. And what is that process? In the application filed, each allocator spelled out what will be their weekly diligence, or excuse me, distribution, 
What will their bookkeeping and review process be look like? How will they verify KYC? How many replicas will be stored? How much of it will be retrievable? So that's what goes into that allocator application that everyone filed. So when we start looking at like reviewing that five petabytes, it's pretty basic. We take what was said in the application and then we compare it to what actually happened. So if you take a look at this slide here, the three main points that we started to look at, and we're gonna really fine tune this, is first off, is the data retrievable? If not, why? And are there steps to remediate? And if they are, that's great. Let's see those metrics to pull it up. The second is the KYC. If a client is asking for this data, what kind of checks have the allocators run to verify that this is indeed an actual client and actual data? So this is where a bookkeeping repository comes in. Some of you that are manual, you have this set up in GitHub. Some of you that are automated tooling, you've been working on your own intake forms. As long as that's made publicly available, that's checking the box. If we can't see any kind of diligence taking place, that's what we're asking about. Who is this person? And what was the verification steps that you did and how was that done? And third is a listing of the SPs. What was that ranking like? How was that selected and really spelled out? So what the governance team will do is we will look at what steps were taken in your distributions. We will tie that back to your applications and allocators, what your role in this process is, is that as the governance team comes back with questions, comes back with anything that we may need, you provide that. So if we can't see any proof of retrievability, maybe we're not looking in the right place or maybe there's something up. If we're not finding your KYC, maybe your bookkeeping repository has changed. So the ask is, and we'll talk about this on the call, if you start to see these issues, we'll tag you into them and we're looking for that additional information. We're also seeking community input on this part. This is a new process as we kind of grow into this model where there's more allocators distributing more data. So we're really keen to get this feedback. What works well, what doesn't? Are we looking at the right things? Is this tricky to go back? So please, as you're answering this, as you're on the call, we're very much keen to get this input. I'll kind of pause before I go to the next slide. I know we have questions in chat, and I'd also like to invite anyone from Fiddle or Galen if you'd like to kind of build off this as we go forward. All right, I'm gonna answer Faye's question. Faye, great question. So in chat, Faye Yan asked, hey, if an allocator received their five petabytes, but they haven't had a refill yet, will they get a refill in the next wave? Great question. So Faye, one of the great ways to kind of think about this going forward is less a wave of refilling the multi-sig like used to happen on the LDN model and more of like individual refills. So if you were allocated five petabytes and you've used none of them, you wouldn't get a refill to bump you up to 10 or 15 automatically. What it would be and what the process that we're working on developing with tooling and processes is that as you start to sustain your data cap distributions, when you reach around that 70% mark, the goal is that this automatically triggers and you'll get a comment from Galen and I in your GitHub. You'll be able to see what the distributions were answer any questions, declare up any diligence checks, and then you'll receive that. So to kind of clarify that, there won't be one large wave that comes through. Yeah, it'll just be individuals that go out. Yes, correct. Jumping in, um, we had some teams that asked for five PIBs. They <clears throat> received that. They have not started allocating yet. They're still building their tooling. That's fine. Currently, we would like to see people apply when they're ready, but we understand these processes are long and different development teams take more or less time. Uh, at this point, we're not trying to um, punish the allocators that were approved that are building some kind of automated or market-based pathway that have yet to start allocating. We would like to get an update from those teams um, and make sure that they're still active and interested. Um, but we are not reviewing all of the, you know, 80 um, applicants and topping all of them up at the same time. We're reviewing the ones that are running out of data cap. Um, we've gotten some anonymous reports uh, from different community members um, to look at those. 
we are going to be asking those allocators to also explain and justify uh, their sort of distribution plan. Is their data retrievable? Why or why not? Um, who are the clients that they are working with? Is there evidence of diligence following their application? Um, and if the allocators cannot justify that, they will not be getting um, topped up. Um, so we're going to be kind of working to make that process a little more standardized. Uh, it has not been the sort of highest priority. We've been working on other tooling things and getting other people unblocked, um, but we will be working to get more standardized reports and more automated uh, reporting to flag on those issues. So yes, that should address the um, questions in chat. And as always, we appreciate people's you know, jumping in and helping us perform these reviews uh, and see um, the goal is ask allocators how they are going to work with clients, what types of clients, what type of distribution, what type of, um, you know, data will be retrievable, give them the five PIBs, let them go start working with clients. And then as they run out, ask them to show evidence that they are following their application plan. And if they cannot, um, or if the evidence is not sufficient or complete, then they will not be renewed. Um, they will not get more under this their current application. Thanks for that, Galen. One question that came through in chat was, does this apply to all? So if you just think about it like a bottle or a glass, which is the chat analogy, once you've consumed 70%, that's when it comes by for this review to go forward. It's hard to perform the diligence and audit if there hasn't been these distributions. So that's why this is set up. And yeah. this is what it looks like. Please go ahead. Yeah, just same. We, we want to give... Uh, teams enough data cap to have them go start working with clients. We've also said this repeatedly. It is better to take a client, ask them some information in an application form, extend to them some amount of trust in a small amount of allocation, and then allow them to start doing deal making and then go verify. It's the same process that the governance team applies to the allocators. If an allocator shows up and says, I have 100 PIBs of client data ready to go, we say, great, here's five, go start to onboard it and prove to us that we have this trust that we can verify. We ask the same thing of the allocators. Here's five PIBs, go start to work with clients, give them a small amount, see how they behave. The thing that we care about more is, are you asking the questions up front? Are you making small and consistent allocations to clients? Are you intervening when clients are not following your compliance? So there was another question in the chat about the standards. Each allocator said how they would perform. If the allocator said in their application that they would require five copies of their clients and they made allocations and they made subsequent allocations to clients and those clients did not say they would do five copies, are not doing multiple copies. They are not distributing per what the allocator put in their application form back in November, December, January. The allocator is going to be held responsible for the client behavior because if the allocator does not intervene, if the allocator continues to give data cap to clients and the clients are not in compliance with that allocator, then the allocator is out of compliance. So if you put in your application, we're going to use, uh, you know, we're going to use this kind of an answer question form to assess, and we're going to only take, you know, enterprise data, uh, and it's going to be retrievable. If you put that in your application, and then you gave data cap out to clients, those clients have landed on chain. We track the allocation they made to the client. We track that client's deal making with an SP. If those SPs are not retrievable, if they're not distributed. The clients that you are working with are not in compliance to your standards. So therefore, you are not in compliance. And so that is how the governance team looks at the allocators, and the allocators look at the clients, and we're looking at this whole picture. This might be a great segue into what it looks like. So if you take a look at this slide, this is kind of a high-level example of an issue. So if you see, there's two links. 
The first link that you'll see is the actual application filed. This was around the November, December, January timeframe when we encouraged organizations to apply. And then the second is the diligence review that was kicked off. So the diligence review will take place in the allocator governance. It's the new refresh of the notary governance. And so if you see in that screenshot, what we're looking at doing is kind of getting a feel for how to build this out in a way that communicates clearly with you as well as the community of standards. So again, it's only looking at your application as Galen spelled out. So if you said you would be using certain SPs or you providing location data, or if you were gonna have this go out with retrievability, that's what we're looking at. So we're really trying to compare apples to apples for each application, which is a little time consuming as we start this for the first time. So thanks for your patience. But then what we're encouraging is that when you see these issues come up, and you're ready for that data cap refresh, you can log in to that allocator governance page and address some of the topics that come up. So for example, we've seen some where we have no record of any kind of KYC or KYB in bookkeeping. And so an organization may say, hey, I changed my bookkeeping repo. I never filed a change to my JSON. That's why you don't see it. So all these examples are a great way to kind of apply that and go forward. So I encourage every allocator who's on the call right now, if you haven't done so already, please check out that a governance issue. There'll be one specific for your organization. It should list out several points. And this is your chance to kind of list out an explanation why or a corrective plan for how you would address this going forward or just kind of make your voice heard. Are we measuring the wrong things, right things as well as this call? So again, you'll see all of that in the allocator governance diligence review. This is what it looks like when you log in. So when you come to this link here, the AI governance issues, you'll see these community diligence review for each allocator. Again, right now this is being done manually as we try to figure out a way to streamline this process and make it simpler for every allocation going forward. This being the first time we've moved to this allocator model, this being the first time we've done this data cap refresh, obviously there's a little bit of like learning, developing the process, documenting it and tooling it. But for you as an allocator, if you're seeking that data cap renewal, I encourage you to come to this governance, check out an issue, and then you'll see that. I'm gonna pause and see if anyone has any questions on how this data cap renewal review is and kind of some questions you may have about what's being measured. All right, we have There's a, a chat from Wayne. Yeah. Galen, do you want to take it? Uh, I'm reading it. Give me one second. I just didn't want to move on. Um, indicates SP are either not available or have 0% retrievability. The client has checked with the SP and claimed through manual check the SP. There is retrievability. Data cap bot still showing 0% how to handle this. Um, so we've talked about this uh, a couple of times. Retrievability can be a tricky one. Um, we have to have a scale consistent standardized way in order to prove retrievability. Um, if the client shows up and says that it is retrievable, that is not enough. That is not simply a sufficient answer to say that this data is fully retrievable to anyone on the network. If the allocator in their application said, we will be working with public open retrievable data, that means that that data should be retrievable by anyone who wants to go get it, not just the client. So that is different than private, encrypted, non-retrievable data. If I was putting a data set on the network and saying, this is data that is widely usable and widely retrievable, therefore it should have data cap, it should be verified. It is adding value to the entire network to have this data on there. That means, that a standard retrieval system like Spark needs to be able to also retrieve it. It is not sufficient for me to say, I have a really useful data set that the entire network should have access to, to then load it with an SP, and then that SP not allow retrievability at scale. And for me to say, well, I can still get it. That does not prove retrievability. That is a single 
claim. Um, we do not have the resources or the bandwidth to go verify every individual client's claim. That is why we will use standards uh, such as Spark um, so that we can go verify retrieval. Um, that's just where we are right now in the scope of the network. If there is a different standard, a different bot that a team wants to build, that they can build, they can open source, they can say the Spark uh, protocol does not work for us for X, Y, and Z reasons. And as an alternative, we have made another retrieval bot Here's the open source code. Anyone can go audit it. Um, we are running it against these SPs and these client applications, and it shows retrievability. Um, we'd love to see that. We would love to see other retrieval markets um, get built and verified. Uh, but as it is right now, the governance team um, is not able to invest in the resources to build multiple retrieval bots um, across multiple different retrieval standards. Um, so right now, we are using Spark. Um, there's another question about uh, issue automatically generated. Right now it is manual um, and we are um, working to get more tooling. The allocators can also kick off their uh, review. If an allocator says I've given out 50% of my data cap and I think that I'm doing a great job, and I want to prove that the 50% that I have given out is high quality and compliant, um, they could capture that as well if they want. Um, so right now it is triggered by uh, pr predominantly by the governance team, but yes, allocators can go in and say, you know, here's, here's what I've done so far. Here's a snapshot of my behavior. These are great points. And as Galen said, please give us feedback as we work to kind of develop this as we go forward. We look forward to it. The next topic that we wanted to cover that we're excited about is what does the rolling application look like for the Filecoin Plus program going forward? So those of you that have been around for a while or following have remembered that typically the way we've done it is have an election cycle where we've encouraged organizations to apply. It's typically once a year. And then that way they can apply, have their application scored, reviewed, and have all the documentation and process set up. The reason why it was typically done on an annual basis, frankly speaking, is a lot of work to collect all the information, verify diligence checks, get everybody configured, and then receiving the data cap. It's a big flow. So without having some type of process in place, it becomes burdensome and overwhelming. So this is why we're really excited to kind of announce this new rolling model for applications, which means that organizations won't have to wait that one calendar year to apply. So the goal of this rolling application is one, to reduce the time burden, both for organizations waiting to get started or an organization who has to reapply. Some of the feedback on the last election was lots of questions, lots of time, took a lot of information to kind of match that to the scoring rubric. So we'll be talking about what does that look like? How do we streamline some of those questions and share more of that and simplify? So if you remember, we've had like a GitHub form and an Airtable form. The reason why we do this is that third point is we have to collect information from every organization about their bookkeeping plan, their diligence, what they're working on. But we also have to verify against sanctions checks, against making sure that all of the GitHub and information matches. So this way, we're going to collect this information while still maintaining privacy for things like your email, your full legal name. Any information like that will still remain only available for the governance team. And then also we have to collect organizations that need help. So some organizations need help configuring their multi-sig. They might have issues with GitHub or adding to Slack. So we have to really address this if this is going forward. So this is what it's going to look like in the next round. And it, we're lucky enough to be joined by Marta from Fiddle, who's prepared a very detailed demo video of what this new application looks like. Marta, I see on the, you're on the call. Would you feel comfortable kind of walking us through this live demo as we share the screen? Yeah, absolutely. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, we hear you great. 
Great. So do you want to turn on the video? Start the video? Yeah, we'll do. Awesome. Great. Thank you. So we'll be uploading this as well, of course. Basically, uh, the way it works is you have to create a new pull request. The easiest way to do it is to create a new um, issue on, uh, sorry, to, to create a new file and then commit it. Uh, any name works, then you just create a pull request uh, on the on there. Go on. Uh, and this will automatically then um, trigger automation that will post a comment. It takes about two minutes to post a comment with a link to the Airtable. So open the Airtable in a new tab, ideally, uh, so that you can have all the details. And more importantly is that you put in your GitHub ID and your GitHub issue uh, PR number here. Um, this is very important, otherwise the application won't sync with GitHub. Fill out all the details. It is a much shorter form and there is a lot of multiple choice questions, so it's faster. Uh, and then put in your Slack ID in our email. Uh, email is important because you will get a confirmation of a successful uh, application in there. This automatically opens an issue of both in the allocator governance uh, and in allocator registry uh, so that it's all then automated and it'll be synced to as a pull request to the allocator.tech and add you there as well. So that's kind of it. Um, and then, yeah, you can see here you have the JSON that uh, triggers the uh, allocator application, and then the email that you get with confirmation. Um, so yeah, it's uh, hopefully quite simple. As uh, you can see on the slide, um, you create a file in allocator. Uh, it's in the, oh, sorry, it's not allocator registry. It's uh, creating a file in allocator governance channel, uh, and then uh, that will usually will contain a link to the Airtable form, and then this will then trigger all the automation. Thank you. Marta, props. That's really beautiful how you set that up. I think that's going to be really helpful as we move forward. We'll pause before we move on to kind of any of the support, because this concludes like this, the governance team sharing updates on how to apply for the rolling to not have to wait for the election, as well as the diligence review. So if you had any questions in chat or wanted to talk about your application, this would be a great time for any individual topics we can cover to help with. Uh, quick thing. I I added one slide uh, very late. Apologize. Could you re refresh or it might be on the wrong um, slide deck now. I just wanted yeah. to. Sure thing. Let me go into it. Sorry. Thanks. While well, Carrie is getting that, uh, I'll just highlight things that I was saying in the chat. Um, there are comments that Spark's bot is not detecting retrieval of nodes. That is something that the SPs for those nodes can work with Spark on. Spark is a different tool. It is not built by the Gov team. It is not built by Fiddle. It's not maintained by either of us. We do not have control over that. Um, last year, we were working on retrieval bot. Uh, there were a couple of different questions about what type of retrieval we would use. Um, those had to become standardized and consistent. There are different protocols and standards for doing retrieval. So we are not the ones designing all of these different retrieval mechanisms. We are using one that is being built by another team. That is Spark. Like I have said, the Spark team uh, can work with those SPs. Those SPs can work with Spark. It sounds like there are issues where in the past, SPs wanted to only whitelist a certain um, request pathway. That is not sufficient to prove that retrievable data is fully retrievable. If you are only whitelisting retrieval to a bot, then it is not retrievable to the whole network. It is not publicly retrievable. So. 
if a client says that my data is going to be retrievable, it needs to be actually retrievable at scale, not just retrievable by that client, not just retrievable by some like cherry picked bot. Uh, it needs to be consistent, standardized, and fully retrievable. <laughs> Um, so there are um, the Spark team is the one that you would want to talk to. If there are questions about what their mechanism is, uh, that's just the standard that we are going to use for now. Um, coming back over to this, uh, we've discussed the request for allocators before. Um, this is something where we put some brainstorming time into thinking about different gaps and opportunities um, currently in the list of allocators. We think that there is room for some more automated meta pathways, um, some more market-based allocators. We have some ideas of things that uh, we would like to see. At this time, as we move into rolling applications, we are going to be prioritizing these RFAs. We're going to prioritize teams that are building things that uh, we think are novel pathways for data onboarding rather than redundant and similar pathways. Um, we have yet to see scale traction on some of these other pathways. Uh, so while we try and find uh, different ways to onboard high quality distributed data to the network, we think that some of these more automated or market-based pathways will be effective. So as we move to rolling applications, we will be prioritizing these. Um, we will be looking at applicants that have put in a very similar application to something that either existed previously or already exists. Um, this is not saying that we won't approve those. It is just saying that those might take longer uh, for a diligence completion, whereas the ones that are doing something like a GitHub automated pathway, uh, we have already seen how that could be successful. So we will be looking for teams to stand up those different pathways and build them. Um, we're thinking about these more as you know ways to onboard clients and data to the network. Uh, they do not have to be manual enterprise scale pathways. Those take a lot longer. Um, those We expect those to be more uh, manual diligence review. That means it's more manual diligence review on the governance team as well as on the allocators. Um, so we want to see more of these high speed, uh, high efficiency automated mechanisms. In the past, we've had a very large and detailed rubric with scores associated with each question. Um, we are moving away from that for now. We're going to try uh, looking at these applications, biasing towards is the application professional? Is the application complete? Is the application reasonable? And if so, we're going to bias towards uh, approving it. And then if they cannot justify the claims made in their application, um, they will not get renewed. And so if, if you are a new team and you are thinking about wanting to get started as an allocator, I think your first best chance is to go look at the request for allocators, see what some of those types are, uh, see which one you think you have a chance of building, and then apply to build that. If you are trying to come and apply to do a very similar manual large data set application, um, you need to think about what is going to be your value add to the community? What additional things are you bringing to the entire network ecosystem um, that is different from what already exists? Additional bots that do retrieval, additional protocols for you know, third-party KYC, additional dashboards to show uh, health and metrics. What what are you building more than just extracting data cap value? So those are the things we want to see. Um, there uh, are a couple edits that we're making to the application form. Um, I'm pretty sure these things are live now. But if you put in an application right now, immediately on this call, um, we might be missing one or two questions or one or two um, answer choices. Uh, we're still kind of going through and testing to make sure that all of the questions and answers are fully complete and that the integration um, works. So bear with us, um, but it should be uh, it should be definitely live by the end of this week, but it, it is live now. There just might be a couple kinks that we have to iron out. So if you submit an application right now, we may go back to you 
um, and ask for you know one or two follow up questions um, where there might be a something that gets um, the formatting might get incorrectly copied over. So just bear with us as we as we test that. Um, but that's everything on rolling applications. I think that's everything. We'll see. Thanks. This last topic is just trying to collect any of the DMs that we see come through in Slack or hit. So there was two questions about some of the tooling updates. I just wanted to bubble this up because Will and KZ had answered this from Fiddle. I just wanted to make sure that they had it. So there was an issue with the tooling in the allocator page where the incorrect allocation amounts were showing. So Will is tracking that. I think they've updated the back end and they're saying that there's going to be a release probably in the next couple of days. So keep your eyes on this. I wanted to thank Mike for filing this ticket and appreciate all the screenshots that you put into it. The other issue that came up in Slack was 54. And this was essentially saying, hey, there's no automated trigger for the next round of data cap disbursement. So wanted to let you know on that one, there might be two reasons why and get some clarification on this call if helpful. As we talked about with the introduction of the review to receive additional data cap, you won't automatically receive a top off. So if I'm understanding issue number 54, if there was any kind of tooling, that's still a ways away that would automate that check. But just to kind of give you guys a heads up, right now, there won't be an automated, you've used five PIBs, you now received your next tranche. That's where that diligence cycle comes through that we're going through. I see KZs on the call. KZ, is there any additional information that you'd like to add on those points for us? Um, no, actually, Kerry, I think you nailed it. Nice. And thank you guys. Realize a lot of tooling is coming on board as you're killing it. Well, with this, I'd like to open the floor up with any time. Again, allocators on the call will be happy to look at your applications, your diligence reviews, answer any question. This, this time is yours. Whatever you'd like to talk about, the floor is yours. Hi, this is D from uh, Topo. I'd like to uh, give some clarification on our allocator dimensions. Yeah, Lee, please. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, because we are uh, the first time as the notary, and uh, we we have found that some circumstances are much more complicated than we expected. Because, uh, for example, uh, as allocators, we are responsible for our clients. But for clients, some, as we contacted the clients, some cl clients complain that actually it is not that easy for them to find the perfect uh, like storage providers from them. And sometimes they have like they have to do their own diligence on their uh, storage providers and. Uh, like we have, like uh, together we develop some 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 routines so that they can do their diligence. For example, they ask the storage provider to provide a, a, a like telephone number with with the country code. They are uh, uh, they claim the storage providers claim they are in, uh, but uh, in most often, so the storage providers are not willing to like make their telephone number public. So we we ask the clients to call them, and it some and uh, in most cases it works, but we cannot public their like make their telephone number public. And uh, another thing about retrievability, I think the main problem is how the park system like take samples of the retrievability. For example, if the storage provider that our client contacted, they already have like 500,000 deals, but for that part of deal is not relevant to our client. And our client, for example, send 10,000 deals to that storage provider and the client can provide 
most of the deals are retrievable. And uh, from our end, we also tested the retrievability of the deals that our client sent to the SP. However, if the Spark system just randomly checks the deals that the storage provider has, there is a high possibility that the check the deals are not the deals sent from our client. So that, that, that makes our client has very, very limited choices on, on storage providers. Actually, most of our clients, potential clients, uh, told us that actually not a lot of storage providers are willing to, to like accept real online deals. And yeah, that's pretty much what I want to say. Yes, this has been, um, this is not news. This has been an issue since the beginning of Filecoin and Filecoin Plus. We don't know which storage providers want to take real deals versus only want to do um, black box minting. Uh, there are some storage providers that claim they want to take real deals and make them retrievable, and then they don't, and they don't make them retrievable at scale. Um, it is The burden is on the client as well as the storage provider. A client can go contact a storage provider, they can initiate a deal, they can see if that deal meets their client needs. Their client needs are determined by the allocator that they are working with. Um, this is all like still an ongoing process and pathway. If a storage provider does not want to meet the requirements, then they are not eligible for data cap. If a client doesn't want to do the work of verifying this information or providing it, then they are not eligible for data cap. It is not a requirement on Filecoin that you get data cap or use it. This continues to be a problem where everyone wants data cap to be freely available and standard standardized for every use case. Um, and that is not how the network is designed. The network is designed to allow deal making peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. It does not require data cap to function. If a client or an SP are not willing or able to meet the requirements of the program, the requirements of the allocators, the requirements of the other parties involved, then they are not eligible for data cap. So if they predominantly are not retrievable, and only certain deals are, that sounds like an opportunity to either go collaborate with the Spark team to make their protocol more specific. That would be a better tool for everyone in the ecosystem. That would be an opportunity for these SPs or these allocators or these clients to say, we want Spark to properly reflect our needs and interests. If a client says, I can't find SPs that will be retrievable, they should be able to go to Spark and see the SPs that are retrievable. They should be able to work with those SPs. Spark now becomes a SP discovery method. So that when clients show up and they say, well, I can't find any SPs to work with, high performing SPs should be able to say, go check. My information is verified and vetted by another independent third party, the Spark third party. Look at how well I am doing on their rankings. If you are an SP and you are not doing well on those rankings, then go work with Spark to figure out what changes you can make or what changes Spark can make. If they are testing your entire SP infrastructure and some of your SP minor IDs are not retrievable because they are private encrypted data, then there could be ways for you to say, we are going to associate these as this one is the minor IDs for private encrypted data. These are the minor IDs for public and retrievable. Those minor IDs for public and retrievable would then perform better on Spark because they would match to that Spark protocol. So all of this is to say, 
we are trying to build a program that says real clients with real data doing distributed deal making that adds value to the entire network. If the clients can't be in compliance, if the data is not in compliance, and if it's not distributed, it is not qualifying for data cap. That has not changed. Well, that has been but, the scope of the program the whole time. Not fair, but it's not fair for clients to be responsible for the retrievability of the deals that not made by them, right? It the client is, is not... only responsible for the responsibility of the retrievability of their own deal, right? Yes, yes. But if an, if an but SP is, is not, not retrievable... A, but the client, but the spark, so now, it's a problem of the spark that is not Great. doing a suitable that job is an for, opportunity. This, for our purpose. But right, that is an opportunity. That, that is an opportunity for the is... SPs to go work with Spark. I have no control over Spark. Yeah, so no, I have no has control control over the Spark except Spark team, right? So Correct. the problem is that we should not. But if that is the case, we should not choose Spark as the tool. Who 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 has the who has the right to decide that Spark should be the only tool for our purpose? We need we needed a tool that would work that someone was maintaining and building. The Spark team is the current standard that we have. It is not, but it's not within working. our it's, scope. It's not working in most for our cover, right? I think from what I have heard from other clients, it works for the clients that want their data highly performant and retrievable. And if the miners are not configured to work with Spark, then the clients probably don't trust those minor IDs. So this is, again, this is an opportunity for SPs to go collaborate with Spark because if the Spark team wants it to be as useful and effective as possible. They want to have the their dashboards showing what the ecosystem wants. Uh, and if they are demonstrating that new deals that are coming on board are retrievable and performant, then that would be a better indication for everyone. So this is an opportunity for the SPs to go collaborate with Spark. There was another hand, but it went down. We have eight minutes. I'll go to uh, MPG and then um, Irma. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Aiden, because I might not be understanding it uh, correctly. Um, I think that the main point here as well is that if uh, an allocator does not like to any of the tooling, uh, we are absolutely free to develop a different tool and say, hey, this is the tool that we use to present data retrievability or compliance or whatever else, and then have the community say, yeah, that looks good. We believe that this is a, a good alternative to to Spark or to whatever else. And you don't have to even develop it yourself. If there is a tool that you already think that is good and presents what, whatever you want to present, then you can present to use that tool. Is that Right. Yes, absolutely. If a if an allocator, if a set of SPs said we use this other method for retrieval, and here's where it can be verified, it works at scale, it is audible, it's open sourced, uh, and it can be proven to work. If there's a different retrieval method, a different dashboard, the problem is if it is simply a screenshot of a terminal posted in GitHub. That is not a scalable way. So if there is a different scalable automated retrieval testing protocol, we would love to see it. If there's something other than Spark uh, that another team has built and is open sourced and public that can be independently reviewed and audited, great. If there are SPs that want to build that, great. We would love to see other things in the ecosystem, just like we love to see more dashboards, we love to see more onboarding pathways, we love to see more data prep tools. Um, the problem is when these are private, closed source, and we can't, no one can verify and confirm the information at scale, 
um, they are not feasible uh, alternatives. I guess reproducible is the most important yes. part of it, right? Yes. Just like any good research. Yes. Yes. Reproducible, uh, independently verifiable, like good research. Yes, that's a good way to think of it. Irma? Uh, hi, Galen. Um, I continue to the, this topic. Um, I, I think that uh, it, it will be take long time to establish a tool. Um, but we uh, at the time now, uh, there's some diligence for the allocators, but we cannot let the such factors, uh, long time factors to affect the standards by uh, which we are judged. And uh, um, is that okay that the allocators uh, to uh, using the manually way, like the screenshot uh, on the GitHub um, now until the next tool, scaly? No, because oh. the governance team is not able to go review a screenshot and prove to the ecosystem that that screenshot is real, verifiable, meaningful. And when we are talking about PIBs and PIBs of data, it is not reasonable for me or other members of the governance team or members of Fiddle to go comb through screenshots claiming PIBs of data are retrievable. If we have tools in the ecosystem that exist and those tools say that data is not retrievable, then to our standard, it is not retrievable. So if we try and follow the trust but verify, the governance team asks the allocator what data they are going to approve. The allocators said, we will approve public, open, data. If it is not public and open, if it is not able to be retrieved at scale, then it does not qualify. And so right now, until someone builds a tool that can prove that demonstrably, then it is not retrievable. If it is just one person using a terminal and posting a screenshot, that does not prove that the data is retrievable. That does not prove that the data is real data. And so where we are in this ecosystem, the Filecoin Plus program cares about real clients with real data doing distributed deal making. And if a person claims that it will be open, public, retrievable data, then it needs to be open, public, and retrievable. And if the only way that we are proving that is from one person yet again saying, trust me, here's a screenshot, but no one else can verify that. And it cannot be verified at scale. It can only be verified by single deal size, one off. I tested, I tested one deal out of 5,000 and that one deal was retrievable one time. That is not sufficient. That is not sufficient evidence that this is a real client doing real deal making. Uh, I got so it. What, so, so what if uh, the client or the storage provider or the allocator provide a script that include like 10% of the ODS they have sent? And if anyone run that script can can be uh, can be convinced that the deals are retrievable, is that if an allocator or a client or an SP wants to make a tool and open source that tool, whether it's a, a script that could run through Lotus, whether it's a different web interface, it would be great if there was a web dashboard interface where anyone in this ecosystem could go say, I want to start with this client, or I want to start with this allocator address, or I want to start with this deal. They could start with any piece of information. They could plug it into that dashboard and they could query, but, is this retrievable? And how long would it take for me to receive a ping back from this SP? And if that SP is not 
broadcasting, that would be evidence that it is not retrievable. Yeah, so but an SPD, even a or... common to use tool can be very time consuming. What if the educator or client or storage provider just provides the script for just for this and this like this batch of allocation? Or, or for example, the allocator just provides the tools to test open source tool to test. Uh, his or her own allocation. Yeah, if if an allocator is, okay? is able to provide something that can be tested by other people to prove that the data that the allocator is verifying, the allocator is connected to a client, that client is connected to an SP. The allocator is responsible for their clients. The clients are responsible for the SPs. That is okay. the trust but verify flow in the ecosystem. If an allocator trusts a client and a client makes claims that cannot be verified, the allocator should not continue to trust the client. So the allocator should build a tool to test their own clients. And that is what we are seeing with the Fiddle team building tools and relying on things like Spark. The Fiddle team has two allocator pathways that they're running. They care about the veracity of their clients. If the Fiddle team says, we have someone coming and saying they have this public open data, they want to use our public open data pathway. They are saying that it's this really interesting genomic data set. They are saying that it is going to be four copies. We gave them... 10 TIBs, they onboarded 10 TIBs, but they sent all of it to one SP, and that SP is not retrievable to our standard, then we don't trust them. So the Fiddle team as an allocator is building tooling to be able to look at the behavior of their clients, because that is what the governance team is going to check for compliance in order to approve more tranches of data cap. So when we go ask one of these allocators, you have given out four PIBs of data cap. Prove to us that you did that in compliance with your application. And if you said, well, I gave it all to four different clients and those four clients are not retrievable and they turned around and they didn't use it the way they said they would, why should the governance team trust the allocator if the allocator is not holding their clients accountable. So that is how this has to flow. So if an allocator wants to build a mechanism, a script, a bot, a dashboard, a web interface that someone else could go audit, that would be great. That would be something that could be used by multiple teams. Uh, I think I think MPG's hand might just still be up from before. Um, I'm going to go to Irma. Yes, that's correct. Sorry. All good. Um, yeah, uh, one question is that do we have a consensus on uh, what's the is the good retrieval rate? Like uh, we're using the Spark now. What is to... a good, what's a good Spark retrieval rate? Yeah. Um, I mean, 100% would be great. <laughs> but, you know, uh -huh. it's a it's a process. So I think I think it's a matter of like, if there is no evidence of retrievability and no evidence of, um, you know, communication yeah. back to clients, uh -huh. that would okay. be a problem. So if, so if the spark is showing no retrieval success for an entire minor actor ID and the allocator is continuing to give data cap to clients who are continuing to work with that minor, with no retrieval, you know, that's an issue. But we've got something like 50, uh, 54 minor IDs that have greater than 50% retrieval. Mm -hmm. That seems that seems to me that, you know, greater than 50% is, is a target starting point. Um, but again, if, if a SP is set up in a different way and they have non-retrievable deals at 
at the same minor actor ID as they have retrievable deals. That seems like something that that SP could work with Spark or could work with how they're configured. And they could change the way their minor actor is set up so that all of their incoming new retrievable deals would be under a new minor actor ID that could increase that percentage in a reasonable way. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think we have we we've talked too much about retrieval <laughs> in this meeting, and uh, I actually I want to talk about the deletions of the ND labs now. Uh, but I think I, ha I have no times. Uh, <laughs> we are five minutes over. Yes, but um, there will be uh, another meeting uh, in in a handful of hours. But I think it'll be very late for for most people. But yes, I know that a lot of people care about retrieval um, because. Yeah. Uh, that is one of our greatest mechanisms to show that if a, it is a real client with real data doing distributed deal making and adding value to the network um, is that these things are retrievable. But we are looking forward to seeing other RFAs like on-chain deal pricing to prove that this is data that someone wants on the Filecoin network. Um, private encrypted data that has other diligence and connected associated deal pricing is another way that we would like to see. This is something that the entire network wants to demonstrate utility and value, um, where we consistently will try and push as a governance team is that we want to prove that these things are real clients with real data, doing distributed deal making that adds value and utility more than just one individual actor Tending to be the client, pretending to verify it, and storing it only with themselves. That is the path that we are trying to uh, build away from. And so all of the things that we ask of these ecosystem partners, how do you help show value? Do you attract new client customers that tell stories of adding their value to Filecoin? Do you build new tools that the ecosystem can use? Do you build new data onboarding? data prep pathways. Um, these are different things that we've seen in the community, and we are excited to keep pushing these ecosystem partners to add more than just that closed loop, you know, black box process. Um, so rolling applications um, are going up. If you have a new pathway that you want to propose, if you are concerned about the pathway that you're currently running and it not being approved for future data cap um, tranches from the governance team, go check out the new rolling application form. Um, and will there will be another call uh, in a couple hours. Thanks, everybody. K Ray, any closing thoughts? No, oh, thanks for your time, Dylan. Really appreciate it. You too, Marta. Thank you. Well, friendly hellos, welcome back to the second allocator call taking place in the Filecoin ecosystem on May 28th. This is a repeat of the morning's call, and let's take a look at what's on the agenda. We're going to start out with just a quick check-in on the logistics for the call. Just go over making sure that you all have the calendar invites and are aware of the time, and a quick refresh on where you can find these recordings if you happen to be looking for them. We'll do a quick check-in on metrics, highlight some of the new allocators, how much data has gone out, and what we're seeing for the Fill Plus. Then the bulk of the call will be spent on two primary topics. The first is diligence reviews. So if you're an allocator taking place, you've received your initial data cap. What does it look like when we start to review that data cap that's gone out? What are the metrics that we're reviewing? How do you communicate effectively back for what you're doing as far as your diligence plans and distributions? And answer any questions you may have. We'll also save time for any questions. So if we're going through this and you have a question specific to your application, this is a great forum. We'll have plenty of time at the end to go open it up, take a look. And if you have any specific questions, Galen's on the line with us tonight and he can kind of address any high level things you may wanna discuss. We are also pleased to announce that we're moving to rolling applications. So this means that we're no longer hamstrung by waiting for a one year turnaround for the lengthy elections. We'll talk about how that process works. And then if any new allocators wanna join or reapply, what that looks like from a technology standpoint. We'll end the call with just a quick check-in from the FAQs that come from Slack. These are tooled, two tooling issues, so we'll be sure to highlight what's going on with those. But as always, 
Anything that's on your mind, we'll have plenty of time at the end of the call. Make a circle back. So as a friendly reminder, this call takes place every two weeks. It's pinned to UTC, so if your time zone shifts, this should not. The times are 1600 UTC and 0200. The link in this slide deck contains the link to the Google Calendar. If you follow this, it will always show up on your calendar. And this slide deck was posted in the Phil Plus channel under the comments for this call. Next call will be taking place on June 11th. If you're looking for a recording for any of these, if you're watching this live, you can go to the YouTube channel and just search Allocator Governance. Or if you go to the Governance repo in GitHub, you'll see that I make an issue after every call two weeks and ahead, and that contains the links to the slide decks, to the recording of the videos. And it's also a place if you wanted to see a specific topic brought up on these calls that you can request it. Just make a comment on the issue. Hey, Kev, I would love to talk about X, Y, and Z and I'll be sure to bake it in there for us so we have a standing item on the agenda. This is our time, so whatever you want to discuss, please add an issue and we'll bake it in. All right, let's take a look at the metrics. So on the slide on the left, that's May 14th, two weeks ago on our last call, and on the right, and the big changes that we've seen is six new allocators have come on board and started allocating data. So welcome, glad to have you, and looking forward to those distributions that you make. They served a total of 16 new clients over that two-week time frame, with 27 petabytes distributed. So big numbers going out, I'd like to welcome those that have started making their initial deal making, and we're here for any support you may need. All right, bulk of the call, diligence. So allocators received their five petabytes about maybe 75 days ago or so. And during that time, the kind of ask was, with this initial allocation of five petabytes, you as an organization, as an allocator, created an application to be in the program. So what we're looking at is what did you say you were going to do and what did you actually do? And that's what this diligence review is doing. And so with this diligence review, it ties back to a process. And what that process is, is that every allocator specified how they would be doing their deal making and distributions, number of replicas, storage providers worked with, how they would be providing KYC. So all we're doing in this review is just seeing if the organizations are maintaining the action plans that they said they would be doing. That's all this is. So if you said you would require a certain number of storage, a certain number of replicas, that's all we're looking at in this process. And to do that, we've raised issues inside of the GitHub that we'll take a look at on this call. And we're just saying, hey, organization, we noticed that you said you would do these things and we saw these things happen. Can you specify why that is? So when you see these applications and you see these discussions, this is your chance to come back and explain, hey, maybe we have the wrong bookkeeping repo. Maybe we don't have the data connected to Spark. Whatever the issue is, we're gonna ask that you leave us a comment. And what we'll be doing is going back to those issues and saying, hey, we've either heard from you and we've addressed this issue, here's your data cap refresh, or we haven't. So on this call, we'll be talking a little bit about that. And I'd like to kind of start with what are we looking at? So as part of that diligence review, I think if you were an organization or an allocator, you should really be looking at three key points. And the first one is, was the data retrievable? And so can we pull that data up? Can we verify that it's on the network? And is it retrievable in the copy? If not, there's a reason why, and we should be identifying what that reason is. So if there's a complication, let us know, and we'll talk a little bit about how those metrics are being measured later on the call as we go through it. The second is taking a look at what KYC or what K by B was performed. So is there a bookkeeping repo? Can we see the request from the client for that data? Can we see the communications on how that communication took place? If you are not a manual allocator and you're working on your own tooling, that's great. But if you have any kind of intake form, whether it's a Google Doc or an Airtable spreadsheet or your own private site, it needs to be public. So if we can't find that information, we're leaving comments like, hey, we must be overlooking where your diligence is taking place. Please point it out to us. And the third is the storage providers. Are we working with the storage providers outlined in your action plan and your application, or is it going a different way? So what the governance team is doing is we're collecting all this, reviewing it, and then we're comparing that to your application. So the standards are set by yourself, and that's the only standard that we're measuring it against. And when we look at this, we leave these comments and these issues for you to kind of let us know. Is something changed? Is something going on? Can we help you? 
And that way we can faster get you that data cap refresh or address what the issue is to make sure that you're set for going forward. So all allocators, whether they're on this call or you're watching this as a recording, as you begin to allocate your initial five petabytes of data cap, once you hit that three or four number, be on the mindset that we're gonna start preparing these issues for you to kind of take a look. So with that, I'm gonna kind of pause. Galen, I see you're on the call. If there's anything you'd like to add before we turn this over for any questions or community input on how this process looks. Yeah, I mean, I think you, I think you nailed it. Um, <clears throat> we asked allocator teams how they were going to perform diligence to assist, to assess if a real client with real data doing distributed onboarding was coming to the network. Um, allocators told us their method. Um, some allocators said we are going to require a certain number of copies and it is public open data and that data should be highly retrievable uh, to anyone else on the network. And that is why we think that it deserves data cap because it is, you know, a research data set and therefore we're going to onboard copies of this research data set. What we are seeing right now um, is, you know, last year we launched some tools to start checking these various claims at scale. There's a CID checker, there's work towards a retrieval bot, there's work towards um, an AC bot, automated uh, compliance bot that would look at a couple different metrics and make you know, faster assessments. And so we're continuing to invest in bots like that. And as it is right now, the pathway that we are using for retrieval, this was something that came up in the morning call. So I'm just going to talk about it a little bit right now is we will be using the um, Spark protocol from the, the Filecoin station team. Here's that uh, Spark repo where you can find them. Um, the Phil Plus governance team, the foundation, uh, you know, we don't have the capacity, the bandwidth, the resources to, you know, for the two of us, K Ray and I, to design and build a retrieval method that would work in all different situations. Um, there are other teams building these different standards for retrieval and testing. Um, and so as it is right now, we are going to utilize what exists in the ecosystem rather than us attempting to uh, create something as an alternative. Uh, we've heard from different people that Spark, you know, is not their preferred mechanism. Um, and we understand that's fine. Uh, but for right now, that is the mechanism that we are going to use. But you are open to design and build something else. Um, but that thing needs to be uh, independently checked. It needs to be, you know, able to be replicated, just like a, you know, good uh, research study. That was one of the, the analogies that came up this morning. So we've seen a couple of places where someone will just have a screenshot showing, you know, one terminal that uh, someone attempted to download one piece or one deal, and that is not sufficient. Um, that is not sufficient to prove retrievability. Uh, if something, if a allocator said we are working with public open retrievable data, and that is the only type of data that we're supporting, and a client shows up and claims, yes, that is the type of data that I have, um, that data needs to be readily retrievable and accessible across the network. Um, and that means not simply one screenshot cherry picked from one example. Um, so for right now, we're using Spark. We encourage collaboration with the Spark team and for people to go contact the Spark team and request you know, changes, collaborate with them. If there are things that you want to design differently with the Spark team, that is fantastic. Let's make these tools work better um, for the real use cases that we are trying to put them through. There's a question here in the chat from Fatman about uh, cold storage. Um, in the allocator application, we asked what type of data, if it's retrievable, if it's private enterprise, if it's you know public, open. Um, and that is the expectation that we are asking allocators to ask their clients. So if an allocator came to us and said, 
we are only you know working with private encrypted cold storage uh, then there's probably an expectation for a certain number of copies and a certain amount of distribution and so those are the standards that need to be met there is no single metric right that proves this was definitely a real client definitely real data definitely distributed onboarding um, the ecosystem has way too many variables for it and there will not be one single solution uh, just looking at retrievability just looking at distribution alone just looking at um, you know piece ids uh, those are only pieces of the puzzle and so we have to look across lots of different metrics. Um, so that's why retrieval, if you claimed that that was the type of data and the type of client you're going to be working with, that's why we care about that. Um, but we also care about KYC, KYB, number of SPs, number of replicas, type of distribution, rate of onboarding, um, all the different things that the allocator put in their application. That's what we'll be checking. Um, there was another question here, current allocation rule fixed or is it allocated according to our question 30? Um, I'm not sure what question 30 was off the top of my head. Um, we've switched to a rolling application, which we're going to be talking about in a little bit. It has different numbers. Um, I don't think it has any numbers. Uh, and so I don't know current allocation rule. I don't know if that means the tranche schedule. But one of the things that we do care about, we've cared about in the past, we continue to take seriously. If an allocator says, I'm going to give out data cap according to a certain tranche schedule. For example, I'm going to give out 10 TIBs. If a client is meeting my standards, I will give out 20. If they continue to meet my standards, I will give out 40, et cetera. These have been things that uh, we have held as part of the, all the way back to when FIP3 was written around scaling trust over time. Um, it is more reasonable to give a certain amount of trust and power to a client and then allow them to begin making deals, begin interacting with the ecosystem, and then see how they behave. Um, so in that case, the governance team is behaving the same way. We asked a whole lot of allocators what they were going to do. They told us, and some of them said, I have an anticipation that I will use 100 PIBs in the next uh, 12 months. We did not give any of those allocators 100 PIBs. We gave everyone five. And then they start to onboard clients. And then we start to check how their behavior is. And then we can scale that trust over time, the same way we are asking you with your clients. So K Ray put it in here. Yes, the allocation tranche schedule. Um, for each individual allocator, your tranche schedule was reported to us. That is what we will hold you to. Um, uh, Mike has a question here that we are going to get to in a second on this call. So I'm going to pause and pass it back over to K Ray. All right. I think one of the things we're looking for, whether it's in text on this call or in your issues, is this box is seeking community input. Great questions. And full disclosure, as we move away from the model where every notary was sharing the same multi-sig with the LDN to more of an individual basis, we're trying to find what is a good left-right limits for these. So if you look at your application, if you look at that diligence review and you're saying, look, I had no idea what my weekly allocation schedule would be when I wrote it, but now I'm finding a more clear path. Please put that feedback in that GitHub issue. That's exactly what we're looking at. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So this is an example of like what a diligence check was. What we do is we pull up the allocator application and we pull up all of the information that you said you would do. Then what we do is we try to go through it line by line on all the deal making that took place on that address for your organization and start to say like, what SPs are you working with? And great, we could see that and we'll list them in that application that we filed. Then we'll take a look at who are those deals sealed with and what their locations are. Is this what you said you would work with in your application? Then we check for things like KYC and KYB. This could be your bookkeeping repo. This could be any kind of form you may use. But what we're looking at is some kind of a public record that shows where this application came from, who are the parties involved, and what's the role in it. If we can't find any of that, that's what we'll spell out. If we do find it, thumbs up, we'll say good to go. 
Then lastly, we'll look at the retrievability. So as Galen mentioned, we're using Spark as the reference point for this. And please let us know if for whatever reason, the data, the storage provider is not retrievable in Spark. That is a, it's a block. So Spark was decided from like a unification standpoint as a standard going forward. If there's an issue that prevents it, please list it. But as Galen mentioned, just a screenshot showing, hey, here's a couple of those retrievabilities that I could pull. What you'll need to share is like, how can somebody pull that for all of the deal making that was done for your organization? So those three points are what we're kind of looking at for the application. We'll spell out if there's any kind of missing data or anything needed, but that's what's put in when we're doing these review checks as they go forward. As we've started this process, I realize that some of you have already allocated your five petabytes. So thank you for your patience as we kind of look through this and kind of do a standard. What we're trying to do is make this as unified across the board as possible. So the standards that we're being held to aren't program specific, they're each allocator and organization specific. So what an allocator needs to do for that data cap refresh is if you come into the allocator governance repository, you'll see that there's an issue here and that will have your name and your organization. You also got a ping from me on Monday saying, hey, we're looking at these. If you have any questions, please come to this meeting. Please ask us what you may need. And what we're trying to do is spell out hey, this is what we thought we were going to see as far as your application schedule. This is what we thought we were going to see from your storage providers. This is what we're actually seeing. So is this checkout for you? And if so, what's the discrepancy going back and forth? Please answer us. So come into the GitHub issue and say, this is what we thought we would do. These are the reasons why we changed it. We can work with you to kind of streamline that, either updating and amending your application to be more real world or figure out what tools we can use in place to verify your retrievability. But in order for us to review that data cap, we have to have some type of public record, some type of public discussion. And this is where it lands right there. So Mike, when that second round will go out, it will start going out for the allocators that finish this. One thing that's careful to note is that we're no longer doing one big batch refill, which means that as these allocators complete these diligence reviews and they're good to go, there's no reason why Mike, you couldn't get that data cap refresh while we're waiting for seven other people to finish updating and letting us know about their diligence checks. So to kind of let that out, once we verified your organization has met your plans, man, thumbs up, can't wait to get you that more data cap and get you out there. So I'll pause and see a couple of questions in Slack and we'll ask anything that's going on. So in chat, there's a question from Genesis, when will the bot be triggered? Genesis, if I understand correctly, maybe that's an old way of thinking. In the old LDN model, we had that bot that would go through there and refresh the data cap for all of the notaries that were signing off that same multi-sig. But now that it's individual allocators, there's no bot that triggers it. The bot will be triggered once all the requirements are met for maintaining the disclosures that you set forward. I'd also like to pause here. If anybody's on the call, EF, Leo, Joss, I know that I sent you guys a couple of pings. Thanks for coming to the call. If you want to pull up anything in your community diligence review, while you have Galen and I, we'll be happy to take a look, answer any questions, or give you any feedback, as well as kind of like go through it. So again, your time on this call, feel free to post it in chat or ask anything and we'll happily go through it. But I'll pause here and wait before going on to the rolling application updates just because this is so important for you allocators to get the refresh or at least have a forum for questions or nowhere to go. Well, all right, if anything comes up, please just post it here. And again, as Galen posted in chat, if you come into the allocator governance issues, you'll see an issue for any organization that's crossed that 75% threshold on their distributions. Love to take a look, leave us a comment. We'll come back and make a discussion to try to get you all set up. We're here to help. 
just let us know and pretty much spell it out in this issue is the best way to get it. All right, next big update is rolling applications. So those of you on the call that have been notaries for multiple rounds that are now allocators, the old model that Filecoin Plus adopted was using an annual election cycle. So notaries and allocators can put in once a year and then onboard onto the network to begin disbursements. The reason for that was it's a lot of work to get all the accounts set up, to get the multi-sigs configured, to get everything locked in step takes time. So it's been a very technological tooling to make it to the point where we are now, where we have a system that can onboard one at a time. So what's nice about this is anybody who wants to come to the network can now not have to wait, but turn in this application. So I'd like to show you what that process looks like and answer any questions that you may have for like, how would you submit a new application or how would somebody come onto the network? as well as Galen would talk a little bit about the RFAs and what kind of allocators we're actually hoping to have come on board to make the program better. So start with the goals. The old way of doing it was time. You had to wait a long time. It was a very lengthy application and it took a lot of back and forth to get it all set up. We're trying to remove that. We're also trying to simplify the GitHub to Airtable. So you just have one standard process and that will automate it back and forth. We're also trying to maintain transparency while keeping information public. So things like your email, your full legal name will not be shared in GitHub. They'll be maintained in Airtable. That way the governance team can perform the sanctions and diligence checks. And then also we're trying to get a way to how can we check out and give you help with like set up a multi-sig or how to do this as a process on the first step. So what we're going to do on the next slide is show you a little bit about what this process looks like. So when you go through it, what you're about to see in this video is you'll come to the allocator governance page in the GitHub repository. You'll make a new pull request. And when you do, it will automatically pull up an Airtable form. You take the issue number from GitHub, you place it into Airtable. And as you fill out that Airtable form, it will collect the needed information. So I'm going to share screen here and just kind of walk you through what that looks like. So as you can see right now, you come into the allocator governance, you make a new issue, and you just name it. So right now we have a new branch with allocator application, but that would just be your name. And then once you make that pull request, it's going to take about a minute or two, so just be a little bit patient as it goes through. And as you can see it loading right there, it merges the pull request. And as soon as it does, you're going to get this link to Airtable. When you follow this link inside of Airtable, it's going to take you to a new page. And if you've done this application before, this is going to look very familiar. It's going to have your ID. That pull request number is what comes from GitHub. So there's 46. So that's 46. And that links the error table to the GitHub. Then you'll answer information about your organization. We tried to make this much less freeform text. So you shouldn't have to write paragraphs and paragraphs. But you just enter what is your contact information? What are your plans? And then when you fill that out and you come back into your proposal, you'll see that all of the information from Airtable has now been migrated back into GitHub, except for that personal information, like your email, your full name. We'll keep that separate in Airtable. And the goal is that there's a lot of transparency in this program. Who's getting the data cap? Where are you from? Where are you representing it? So again, all of these issues are going to be found in the governance. Once you make that issue, you'll see it. Everything from your JSON file to all the information on your organization. The goal is this should be much faster, much easier, not just for you, but for us in processing. And we can spend a lot of our time helping unblock versus a lot of that mundane stuff. So this should make it easier to come on board. I like to pause and see if anybody has questions about that process as we look at it. All right. Well, any questions, please feel free to bring it back. If you signed up to be a manual allocator and you've distributed your five petabytes and for whatever reason, you don't think that it's going to be possible to maintain your diligence plans, your KYC plans, this could apply to you. We are prioritizing allocators that are outside of the manual model. 
So this could be automated, this could be market-based allocators that come on board. So I'd like to hand it over to Galen, who's gonna kind of walk us through what that RFA is looking like for different types of allocators that you may want to submit for. Yes, thank you. Um, so we've talked about the RFA request for allocators, um, the governance team and the fiddle team, we did some brainstorming a little bit ago to come up with a couple different uh, possible starting point types for different automated or market-based um, allocators. Uh, they have a blog post there talking about those. We want to identify like other sort of onboarding pathways that could be used. We saw a lot of people apply to be um, manual uh, diligence, very similar to the sort of existing large data set pathway. So at this point in time, there's some questions on the new rolling application form uh, where you could select that you're responding to one of these requests for allocators um, or that you are doing sort of a similar pathway to what already exists um, or that you're doing some other different kind of novel uh, pathway. And so as it is, just given uh, resources and constraints, we're going to be prioritizing um, applications that are coming in over these RFAs. Um, so we have a number of teams that are onboarding with manual diligence. We're continuing to invest in those, invest in tooling, invest in kind of client onboarding pathways um, to make that process faster and easier. Um, but as it is, we did not get as many teams building sort of market-based or automated um, pathways as we were hoping to see. So that's why we're prioritizing those. Um, in the past, we've used a large rubric to do scoring for these applications where every question aligned to a score and had sort of a set of qualitative um, or quantitative definitions that gave a score. We are not doing that this time. Again, as we move to this rolling cycle, we won't be getting as many applications um, at a time. Our hope is to get the applications, review them, check that they are complete, professional, reasonable, that they have sufficiently answered and identified uh, the information, that there's a safe enough bet that they are ready to onboard clients uh, and understand sort of the expectations of that. If that seems to be true, we're going to be trying to, like I said, first prioritize ones that are doing the RFA, and then after that, reviewing the ones that are um, doing similar existing pathways. Uh, hope to unblock those and onboard those teams. So there were some other questions around, you know, in the chat around the like second allocation. Um, there is not going to be a second, you know, election cycle where we have all of the 80 teams reapply. Um, we're looking at teams as they run out of their five PIBs. This is what K Ray was talking about with the compliance check. We are asking teams to explain to us, provide a compliance report to the governance team to justify. We've started to pull some compliance report data. Um, and this is an opportunity for these allocators to uh, sort of convince the governance team and the public and the community that they are working with real clients, with real data, doing distributed deal making. Um, if these things are not upheld, uh, if there's not sufficient evidence, um, then they will probably not get renewed. Those teams, if they want to continue being an allocator, could come reapply under the rolling application cycle. Um, they'll need to apply under the new set of questions and um, come confirm kind of the new standards and expectations. Um, so that's some information there. Um, uh, data cap, as it is right now, data cap does not expire. Um, this is a question that's come up a couple of times. Um, we are not going to give, you know, another allocation uh, from the root key holders and, and the governance team if you have not used the five PIBs um, yet. So if, you know, if a team says, well, we, we have our five PIBs, but we're still working on client, you know, pipeline and, and discovery, can we have five more so that we have 10 PIBs in case we get a bunch of clients? The answer is going to be no. Um, that's not how the process is going to go. But as it is right now, um, similarly, you know, we've had proposals in the past for removing uh, old or latent or stale data cap from clients. Um, that's currently not our highest uh, priority compared to 
unblocking and working with the allocators and the clients that want to use data cap um, correctly. So, so that said, right now there is not an expiration on data cap or on being an allocator. Um, but I think that covered questions in the chat and the RFA. Great. Okay, right back to you. Yeah, great questions, Easy Phil. So that's a big one. So just everybody to foot stomp on it. Your data cap does not expire. So as you've made these allocations, as you've had that, please feel free with that. So with that, I'd like to turn it over, open forum on FAQ, and then any issues that you'd like to dive into before we end with any kind of issue updates from Tulum. Oh, sorry. Uh, maybe I had the slides out of order. Is the tooling update after FAQ? Yeah. Oh, okay, my bad, ignore me. That was my frequently asked question, where are we? <laughs> Let's just do it now. We'll do it live, Bill O'Reilly style. So I'm trying to highlight some of the questions that come through with Slack. You probably see Slack gets a lot of information. So just to bubble it up, there was two tooling updates that have come across the, the pathways and Fiddle's working on them. So just to kind of speak on their behalf, issue number one is tooling issue 50. And what this is, is essentially what's going on is the incorrect allocation amounts are showing up on the allocator tech page. So what they've done is they put together a staging instance and we'll make it easier for them to troubleshoot and diagnose this. A lot of the team was out for a US holiday, Memorial Day yesterday, back in the office today. And what they're kind of committing to is an update by Wednesday or Thursday for kind of correcting that issue. So you should see 50 corrected and fixed as a result on the allocator tooling page. The second was a question about, hey, how do I automatically trigger my next round of data cap? So that won't be coming through in tooling. Right now, that's that manual process where once you've used that data, we'll make an issue that you can come through and say, hey, you've used your data. This is how we saw it being used. This was within standards and this was outside. So issue number 54, that won't have a tech solution to push out a refresh. That's a human situation where you kind of update, hey, this is what I did. This is what I didn't. Right now, we're putting this form together based off our polls. We're working on a process right now where it's a template where we can say, hey, as an allocator to make this faster for you, so it goes from a day down to just a moment, where, hey, these are the deals that I made. This was the retrievability. This was the KYC check I did. And it's verified, push, and you're out the door. So you won't see an issue to 54, but you will see 50 coming through. And Fiddle's excited about the staging instance that's now set up. It should make that rapid iteration a lot faster for you. So with that, back again. I was just going to... Please. Let me jump in, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm looking at 54 right now. And also uh, Genesis's question in the chat. And it seems like they might be talking about... We, we might be mixing up what we're talking about here. Um, I'm not sure if 54 is talking about next round of data cap allocations for the client, which is what Genesis is asking about. Um, and it sounds like the Netty team is working on this. So I think we should clarify uh, on 54. Um, so let me just ask a question on that issue. Because 54 might be talking about client allocation rather than uh, allocator amount. So we'll see. So currently, there's not plans for a like subsequent allocation for the entire allocator. So when the allocator uses their five PIBs, we've talked about a bot or a trigger or a notification that would kick off that compliance check to the governance team. Um, that's not currently the highest priority. However, I do think that there is a subsequent allocation to the client. Um, which is, should be running on once a client has received their first allocation of data cap and they start making deals when they are ready to receive a subsequent allocation from an allocator. Um, so I do think that that really is being developed uh, for the subsequent allocations to clients. So I'll go do a clarifying question on uh, issue 54.
So we'll make one last open call. Again, if anybody wants to highlight an application or discuss, we're right here. If there was a call to action that came from this call, it's that if you got a ping, please come through this diligence check. Please fill out any questions, ask, give us feedback. That way we can get that data cap refreshed and out to you as quickly as possible. All right, everyone. We'll be available in Slack. If you have any follow-up thoughts or questions, the fill plus allocators is probably the best channel to post that for the fastest response. Just post it there, tag myself, Galen, or any member for fiddle, and we'll be happy to work with you and get you what you need. Because again, call to action. Please come through and do your diligence reviews, leave comments, leave feedback. That way we can get you that data cap for your all right, everyone. You have a wonderful two weeks. We'll see you on the June 11th call. Here if you need anything at all. All the best, everyone.